The Bertrand model has some unrealistic predictions. In the equilibrium of the Bertrand model, firms are pricing at marginal cost and earning zero profits. In reality, when there are a few firms, usually they're making positive profits and they're pricing above marginal cost. How can we alter the Bertrand model in order to improve its match with reality? So here we're going to look at some assumptions we've made, which perhaps do not match reality, and how they can affect the equilibrium of the model. So first of all, in our model, we had homogeneous products. What if we had product differentiation, or there were costs of switching from one good to the other? Then consumers would be less price sensitive. With product differentiation, there's something more to care about than just price. With switching costs, there's a cost of going from one brand or firm to another. And so the change in price before they switch has to be more than an infinitesimal amount. So we're going to look at product differentiation in detail later. We'll also look at search costs. So search costs, what are they? Well, it might be that consumers don't know the prices all the firms are offering. So there might be imperfect information. To find out the prices the firms are offering, there might be a cost involved. This is a search cost. So it's the cost of going to the store and finding the price. So how can search costs affect the price? Well, if there's a search cost, it might be that consumers don't know all the prices and therefore a price cut by a firm may not be observed by consumers. So the last two here we're gonna look at right now. So we have capacity constraints. So what's a capacity constraint? Well, it's just a constraint on how much the firm can produce. And so the idea here is that a firm might not be able to satisfy all the demand. In particular, it might not be able to satisfy all the demand at a price equal to marginal cost. And so therefore a firm might still get demand if it prices above the other firm. Dynamic competition, in our model, we assume there's just one period, so it's a one-shot game. But in reality, firms are often competing against each other over time. And so undercutting another firm today might have consequences in the future. And therefore, there might be a deterrent effect because of these future negative consequences. So each of these changes in the Bertrand model affect that incentive to undercut a price above marginal cost. In particular, they reduce the incentive to lower the price below another firm that's charging a price above marginal cost. So to consider the case of dynamic competition, let's think about a model where firms play the Bertrand game repeatedly forever. So we're gonna think about why in such a model it might be possible to sustain higher prices. So we have the Bertrand model. It's an infinitely repeated game. They keep playing it forever. And we're going to look at how a grim trigger strategy can sustain high prices. Let's think about why it can be an equilibrium to play a grim trigger strategy. So let PM be the monopoly price. And let Pi M be the monopoly profit. We're going to see that it can be an equilibrium to price at the monopoly level PM and get half the monopoly profit each. So the strategies we're going to look at uh, grim trigger strategies where they play the monopoly price as long as each firm has played the monopoly price in every previous period if any other price has been charged then they price at marginal cost so if a firm cheats and lowers its price then they'll have marginal cost pricing forever and get zero profits whereas if they don't cheat then they get a share of the monopoly profits so to see whether this is an equilibrium we have to See, is there an incentive to undercut? Because undercutting is going to bring a short-term gain. They'll get all the demand and get close to a monopoly profit. But it has a long-term loss in that they get zero profits after that. So first of all, if they don't cheat, what profits do they get? Well, they're pricing at PM and they're going to get half the monopoly profit in every period. So this is their stream of profits. It's half pi M forever if they don't cheat. Whereas if they cheat and lower their price to just undercut the other firm, so they charge a price just below PM, they get all the demand and they'll get approximately the monopoly profit. But they'll only get that profit in the first period. After that, they'll both be pricing at marginal cost and earning zero profit because they're playing these grim trigger strategies. So we need to compare these two streams of profits. And to do that, we need what's called a, a discount factor. But the idea here is just that when a firm cheats, it's going to gain half the monopoly profit. But after that, it's got 
losses in every period. And so it will only cheat if it puts enough weight on this first period. So if the firm doesn't care at all about the future, it only cares about today, then it's going to cheat and monopoly pricing would not be an equilibrium. Whereas if the firm cares enough about the future, then it won't want to cheat. It cares too much about these losses and profits and therefore we have an equilibrium where they play these grim trigger strategies and the equilibrium outcome is a monopoly price in every period. So the idea here is that when firms play the game repeatedly, there's this potential for the long run loss of undercutting to outweigh the short term gain. So now we're going to look at the idea of capacity constraints and how they can affect the equilibrium in the Bertrand model. So let's think about a case where a firm is subject to a capacity constraint and cannot produce more than that capacity. So the capacity constraint here is going to be K and we're going to assume that one of the firms has a capacity constraint that is less than the market demand at marginal cost. What this means is that when the price is equal to marginal cost, this firm cannot satisfy all the market demand. So we're going to show that with a capacity constraint less than this quantity, D of C, it's no longer an equilibrium to price at marginal cost. So let's suppose it's firm B that has a capacity constraint. We're going to show that if the prices are equal to marginal cost, there's an incentive for firm A to deviate. At these prices, both firms are making zero profit. Suppose A raises her price by a small amount, so now her price is above marginal cost. Because B cannot satisfy all the demand at marginal cost, firm A is going to get the leftover demand. It's going to get the demand at their price minus what the other firm, firm B, can serve. So this leftover demand goes to firm A. It makes a positive profit because now it's pricing above marginal cost. So this is a strictly profitable deviation and so it's not an equilibrium for the firms to price at marginal cost. What are the equilibrium prices? Well, this is a bit complicated and we're not going to go into that, but we can see that capacity constraints imply that it's no longer an equilibrium to price at marginal cost. So to summarize everything, when products are homogeneous, there's perfect information, firms interact only once or a finite number of times, and there are no capacity constraints and the marginal cost is constant, then the only Nash equilibrium is marginal cost pricing. And the reason for this is that discontinuity in demand, the demand curve is essentially horizontal at the rival's price, and this gives each firm a strong incentive to undercut the other firm. However, if firms interact infinitely many times, or an uncertain number of times, because we can think of an infinitely repeated game as a game where they're uncertain whether the next period is going to exist. So if firms interact infinitely many times, then the threat of future punishment may be enough to deter undercutting. And then the firms have a capacity constraint and therefore one of the firms is not able to satisfy all the demand. There's going to be some demand left over even if the firm prices above the other firm.